let's um, stop and uh, and think and talk about this passage that we have uh, before us today. It's in your bulletin, I noticed, um, printed here. Uh, we're going to focus on the first half of it, uh, but if you have a Bible or your bulletin, you can open up and we're going to read uh, from 2 Corinthians 6, 3 to 7, 4. Um, and let's, uh, let's pray before that. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would bless this uh, reading of the word, bless this sermon, uh, that you would humble myself and humble all of us as we stand before you in your glory and honor and, um, and stand before your word and open up our hearts to what you would teach us today. In your name, amen. 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 So, um, 2 Corinthians 6, 3 to 7, 4, we'll read the whole thing and, um, and, then, uh, and then talk about it. 6.3. We put no obstacles in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, and calamities, beatings, imprisonment, riots, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand of, and for the left. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and yet behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We've spoken free to, freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us. You are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak to you as children, widen your hearts also. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Bilal? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? We are, uh, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As I said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will come to you. Then I will welcome you, and I'll be father to you, and you will be uh, father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from the, every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to the completion in fear of God. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I say before uh, that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I'm acting with great boldness toward you. I've had great pride in you. I'm filled with comfort in all our friction, and I'm overflowing with joy. Amen. Well, that is a... Ooh, yeah, there's a lot there. That's a, um, uh, a mouthful. But um, my intention um, this morning is to take that at, corporately, to think through that passage and to process that passage corporately as a body, as believers, as the church. I think there's lessons to take from that passage, many of them, individually. Um, most of the time, sometimes when we hear that passage uh, in verse 14, 714, do not be, rather 614, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Uh, that's often taken individually, and different parts of that are in, 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 spoken of individually. Obviously, all the stuff that Paul went through was an individual thing that he went through, uh, but I think uh, for our purposes this morning, and as I kind of play this back and forth between the two cultures that I'm involved in, the United, the United States and, and Ukraine, um, it may be helpful or may be interesting to take it as, as corporate, as it says in, in, uh, in verse, in my glasses to see it, verse 11, we, freely, we have freely spoken to you Corinthians. This was written to a church. This is written to a group of people. And, uh, and we'll, start, we'll start taking it from, from there. That's my case, at least. Um, this relationship that he describes here in these verses between us as believers, as the church, and them as non-believers, as not the church, is a fascinating one and an extremely challenging one. You see the hard stop that happens between verse 5 and verse 6. Um, 
uh, in Second Corinthians 6. Oh, all the stuff that he talks about before that, all the terrible beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleep nights, hardships, calamity, etc., 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 and then hard, sh- hard stop, and verse 6 starts. Whiplash style. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, Holy Spirit, general love, da, 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 and so forth. That, I think, is maybe a helpful way to think of our lives and our church in relation to the culture, because we have this... Um, this place where we live, in our case, a country, right? We live in the United States of America. Probably everyone here, most of the people here are, are, are citizens of this country. We are, this is, this is the country we identify with. This is our culture. And moving the concentric circles in from the United States of America into uh, Pennsylvania, into this part of Pennsylvania, into your family heritage, into your family, all of the, we have all of our little circles that exist within this, within our larger identity uh, as as believers with a uh, passport, with a uh, U- U.S. passports are blue, Ukrainian passports are green. So we all have this, uh, most of us here, let's just for the sake of argument say, we all have this blue passport identity uh, and we're all members of this, of this group, maybe a smaller group, but maybe a larger group, but we're all I- identified as members of this group. And all of these identities have their own challenges, have their own issues and so forth. We are also, as it says over and over again, and I think this is Paul's idea here, right? Is he's, he's co- comparing and contrasting that relationship with our identity of our passport or of our smaller uh, group or Pennsylvanians or however we call ourselves uh, with our identity as believers, right? With our identity as members of the, the body of the children of God. And that is what I'd like to think about with you today, using some examples from our, this country, uh, which has its own challenges, obviously, um, as well as um, examples from the country that I've been most um, recently identified with, so to speak, uh, as, uh, as Ukraine and, uh, and so forth. So how do we, how do we, in the title of my sermon, embrace the culture around us at arm's length? Uh, because this this description that Paul gives us here is not embracing it entirely, right? There is a little bit of wait a minute. I mean, he goes he goes on in fourteen and beyond with seven, five, six, seven examples of ways that listen, you're different, you're different. Don't do that. You know, you're not those people. Unequally uh, yoked with unbelievers. Again, in my in my premise here, my case is that w- that can be taken culturally. For what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness, or fellowship light with darkness, or, or Christ with Bilal, or a believer a portion, etc., etc., uh, temple of God with idols, and so forth. So there is this sense that which we are not them, right? We are different as a culture, but yet we are a part of it. How does that? How do we work that out? And how do we? How do we think that through? Uh, and it's different. I think it, it might be different for those of us uh, here in the States as, and, uh, than for those of us in, uh, in Ukraine. So just to set the table a little bit, uh, as was mentioned, most of my last 25 years uh, have been spent in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, that's where uh, my girls, um, uh, my adult girls have uh, grown up. That's where Zachary was adopted from. Uh, this is our home in many ways. And what does a missionary do? When a missionary, I think the simplest definitionary definition, at least culturally, of a missionary is to move to some place, embrace and love uh, that culture and, and gain a new identity in that world in order to uh, build Christ church and to share, uh, share Christ's kingdom uh, around you. Uh, so we moved to Ukraine and my goal my then was to embrace it in such a way that I loved what those people loved um, and uh, cherished what those people cherished and understood what those people understood in order to preach the Christ, uh, pre- preach Christ uh, to them in their own language and their own culture. So we learned the language, we, uh, we watched the sports, we ate the foods, we became Ukrainian um, in, uh, in, in many ways. And it, it obviously holds a, a great place in our heart. Uh, but Ukraine itself has gone through a number of 
huge changes. So even Ukrainians are trying to understand what it means to be Ukrainians uh, right now. Maybe in some way, like Americans are trying to understand what it means to be an American right now in this country. Uh, we moved there in 1996, uh, 1997. Uh, 1991, as you'll remember, was a turning point in that country's independence of Ukraine, August 20, 1991. And at that point, everything changed. And the extent to which those changes happened are just breathtaking. Uh, the currency changed, it went from the ruble to what is now uh, the Ukrainian currency, the grivna. So the, the money that you have in your hands changed. Street names changed. All the street names that had Soviet leaders now, you know, moved to Ukrainian leaders or, or uh, poets or, or things like that. Holidays changed. You stopped celebrating Memorial Day in their case or whatever it was. You know, you stopped celebrating some holidays. You started celebrating uh, different holidays. The whole legal system changed. Uh, I mean, it, you know, the educational system changed. Who the country viewed as heroes and who the country viewed as villains changed in, uh, in, in 1991. I mean, just to, just to give you an example of this, someone, my, or even younger than me, um, who was born in the, the city of Yalta, you, if those history buffs will know it from uh, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, right? Someone born in that city, and I was born in 1970, let's just say 1980, uh, or even 90. This so was born there. They grew up there in that city, Yalta. They have never left that city. They have a, a Soviet passport from the Soviet Union. 1991 comes, boom, that country's gone, uh, or that union's gone. Now they, they stand in line and get a new passport for a new country. So 1991 to 2014. Now they're now they're citizens of another country called Ukraine. New laws, new new new. Um, uh, currency, new holidays, new street signs, I mean, the whole deal. 2014, Russia comes in and annexes Crimea, and uh, this, again, this citizen of Yalta uh, would go stand in line for his Russian passport. And he would now be a, a citizen of the country of Russia. New laws, new holidays, new, new currency. I mean, the whole deal, all the way across the board. So this person who could be as young as, what would that be, 35 years old uh, or so. Let's say 30 years old. Actually, it could be 30 years old. That's right. Could th a 30-year-old Yeltsin, if that's what you say those people are, could have been a citizen of three countries with all of those three, you know, th those three identities and never have left the city limits of his country, or rather of his, uh, of his city. It's really remarkable to think about that um, in terms of the, of, the, of, the, of the change that happened. So what is, so, and Ukrainians obviously are asking themselves now, what does it mean to be Ukrainian, right? <laughs> what does it mean to be Ukrainian? What is it, what, what's, what, where is my identity? And that's, I think, what get, Paul's getting at here with, this, with, with, with these passages. Where do we find our identity uh, and who do we associate with? Uh, obviously, that, you know, just going back to that fictitious, well, it's not fictitious, that person from Yalta um, uh, or anywhere in Crimea, um, they have an identity. They voted, you know, in all the elections that were open to them, presumably. Uh, they were engaged with the community around them. They had, a, 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 they had a, a kind of an idea of what it meant to be someone from their city. And that changed rapidly, in their case, dr dramatically, uh, three, times in a, three times in a row. What does it look like for us as Americans and for Ukrainians now in, in, in the middle of this war to identify with and to understand their identity? What is, where does our identity with Christ, in Christ stop? Uh, it doesn't stop, but just humor me here. Where does my identity in Christ will stop and my identity in, in my community or in my culture or in my country uh, begin and how do those things work together? And those are difficult questions, but some clues I think are given in this, uh, in this uh, passage. Paul talks about this in relation to the temple um, over and over and over and over again. Uh, in chapter 6, verse 16, he starts on the temple analogies. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As I said, I will make my dwelling, and he's quoting here from the Old Testament, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, Go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. I will welcome you as I welcome the Father to the sons to be holy to me, says the Lord Almighty. This analogy of uh, the temple is that we now are part of the temple, right? Christ has built 
us up into his temple, of which he is the cornerstone, and describes us as members or part of that temple being now built on the foundation of the prophets. Uh, taking this in larger context, we've been brought not only close to him, but to each other uh, as members of this household. Ephesians 4, 6, uh, 4, 16, we are members of one body, and we have now members, uh, members into, in, included in, 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 into this new family. So Paul here, I think, in my opinion, is reminding the Corinthians over and over and over again, you have another passport. You have another identity. You have another kingdom that you are a part of. And worshiping, uh, verse 12, um, uh, he says, Why didn't you? you are not restricted by us. You're restricted by your own affections. That affection... I think is the central and, and, and kind of turning point of this passage. Where are our affections? We are, in fact, members of this new temple, members of this new covenant. We have this relationship. We have, just like this arm's length thing that I talked about, we have a real physical relationship with people in Idaho and California and Alaska as, as, as citizens of the same country, and have the same passport, uh, color passport, and, and, and a real identity with them. We both share in the same elections. We both have the same currency. All those things I talked about, the three things that happened in Yalta, we have that together, <coughs> excuse me, as, um, as members of our, as members, or citizens, rather, of this, of this country. Also, don't we, as Paul says here over and over again, have a real and, and, uh, if not physical connection with believers in, for example, Venezuela and Uganda and Taiwan. We have, we don't share the same passport, don't share the same language, don't share the same currency, holidays, street signs, we wouldn't share any of those things with our, with our brothers and sisters in Christ in just choosing three countries at random, uh, Venezuela, Taiwan, and Uganda. We don't have anything in common with them, but yet we do, right? We have everything in common with them. We have, we share what? We share a covenant. We share a savior. We share a hope. Uh, we share all of these things that Paul talks about in starting in verse in chapter seven. All these promises um, in chapter seven that that uh, the first. What is it? What did I say? Through two, through four, uh, seven, one through four. We share all those same promises with our, with our, with our, our a sister uh, who's a believer in in the country of Venezuela. All of those same promises. So, what is and how do we work out our relationship with uh, with them? And I think Paul's example here, that hard break that happens between five and six, Endurance, afflictions, hardship, calamities, those are all physical. Notice the examples that he gives in, in five and before are all physical, things that happened to him. Imprisonment and shipwrecks and bad things that happened to my body that I saw with my eyes and all this stuff. Everything that happens after six is hope, is not physical, is spiritual, right? That's everything after six is, is spiritual, speech, truthful speech, patience, kindness, uh, Holy Spirit, genuine love, um, power of God, weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, and honor and dishonor and so forth. And that is our Christian life, isn't it? Is, is, is integrating, is, uh, what's the right word? Um, pairing, maybe. Uh, that phys all those physical things that happen to us because physically we, ha we share things that happen with us and, 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 and the person in Idaho or, or Alaska or California or whatever in that, you know, we, we all see the same news. We all see the same, we all see the same election results that affect us. We all see, you know, the laws that affect us, currency that goes up and down that, you know, is our dollar, the, the dollar worth more in Idaho and Pennsylvania and all that stuff. We all share those things physically with that person in Idaho. But after post verse six, after verse six, we all share that same, all those, we all share those spiritual things with the person in Venezuela, right? We all share that together with, with, uh, with that person. So how can we, and, and the physical's always easier to remember and to think about than the spiritual, it seems, at least in my experience, for me. Um, things that happen to me physically, people that I see, people that call me and people that whatever, are, are, uh, make 
can make more of an impression than, than and the spiritual things. And Paul's goal, I think, here in this passage is to remind us all, especially in 7 and, and following, that um, uh, remind us all of the spiritual truth that is in us and true of us. Don't forget about that. Yes, you have elections because a couple, because a couple of things, and, and, and the first and foremost of them is is hope, right? Um, there is at least in maybe a more of a glimmer now, but in the month of February and March and April, there was very little hope in the country of Ukraine. Uh, as I was mentioning in the uh, in the Sunday school, think back to March of 2020 when when the news of COVID started to break and all of the big things in our lives started to get canceled. The NBA season got canceled, the, 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 whatever, the, uh, your, your work, you know, your work got canceled and I don't know, everything got canceled. Everything, everything started to fall apart. And you thought, at least I thought in March, you know, wait a minute, what happens here? Uh, the, the de it's, it's, it's one of those earth moving under your feet moments where you're like, wait, what? How is this going to, you know, what my mom talks about is the day JFK was assassinated. Like that moment for her and her generation was so destabilizing. Like, what, what, uh, what now? Uh, kind of a moment that March 2020 is obviously what Ukraine is experiencing in the spring of 2022. What now? Am I, am, am I going to be in a situation like that Yalta person that I mentioned where I'm going to have to literally stand in line and get a new passport and be a citizen of a new country? Am I going to, you know, what's going to happen? We had 7 million people leave the country into Europe uh, to, um, to um, uh, move towards safety and so forth. So that, that, that identity... Maybe for some of us in March, maybe for my mom when JFK assassinated, maybe for uh, uh, maybe for uh, uh, us in, in this room in March of 2020, and certainly for Ukrainians in 2020, in March, in spring of 2022, is wait a minute, who am I here? What's my identity? What is wh where is my where is my hope found? And without this understanding without our understanding of our security in our identity with Christ without our understanding of our security in uh, in Christ in his church in the covenant in the temple um, it can and does lead toward hopelessness right I mean what where is our hope if we do not have those things around us that we're all that we all assume what if in our case in the United States um, what if the dollar collapses uh what if the president you know what i mean there's all kinds of worst case scenarios uh that people think about and are becoming more and more common to think about in the united states about what might happen i don't know i have no idea what's going to happen but what i do know is that this, these promises that are pr presented in this passage are true because whatever worst case scenario we have about our country that you know, this person's going to get in control and they're going to do this and that's going to mean this and therefore no more whatever. Uh, all of that, um, all of those worst case scenarios, I can say this, have already happened in, for example, Venezuela. Oh, the economic, the economic uh, um, collapse of that country is terrible. Uh, in Ukraine. You know, that has been in, that has been invaded, and there's, as I mentioned in the Sunday school, more Ukrainian children not living at home than are living at home. Uh, 14 million uh, people have moved west. About half of those left the country, and half of those are still in the country. But the, the numbers are just staggering. So that worst case, whatever worst case scenario we have in our minds about this country, um, whatever that may be, these promises are still true, right? Because I can report this from being in Ukraine two weeks ago um, and not anywhere near the fighting on orders of my wife. Um, I was in the West. I was in the West. I did hear the air raid sirens, but I wasn't, there wasn't any, uh, there was no missiles in my, my, in my city. Um, is that that worst case scenario has come. It's unclear how, it's unclear, it was unclear whether Ukraine was going to exist in March, in my mind at least. Uh, I do think it's going to exist now, but it's very unclear how this thing's going to, um, uh, how the winter, how this winter is going to go. It's going to be a very cold and uh, and very dark winter in in Ukraine. But 
in, uh, in the denomination that was mentioned uh, when I was introduced, that those 15 churches that are members of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church of Ukraine still exist. With the exception of Herson, which is the, the building is closed right now. That's the city that was just liberated a few months ago. Um, th with the exception of that city, all the churches still exist. All the believers still have that hope, right? Missiles are not. Lights are not. Uh, you know, whatever. Um, currency, which has dropped about half of its value now uh, since February, or not. Uh, whatever that, that or not, all of those things, all of these things, rather, are still true uh, of the Ukrainian believers. And it's, and it's one of the most humbling and emotional, frankly, uh, things that I've seen is to see our Ukrainian brothers and sisters and Venezuela, I don't know Venezuela, but I've, I've, heard, I've seen her on the news. And the brothers and sisters in these kinds of countries, including Ukraine, which is close to me, um, retain these promises and and identify with their uh, with their security with our identity in Christ um, above and beyond their uh, national identity, whatever it may be. It, it is absolutely a remarkable thing because these things are easier to read. <coughs> Feels like there's an air rates error right now. <laughs> these things are easier to to read than they are to believe. I guess that's true for a lot of the Bible, right? But these things are easier to, to read than, the, than they are to believe. Um, 7.1, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness into completion in the fear of God. Make room in your hearts, hearts uh, for us. Verse 4, I'm acting with great boldness to you. I have great pride in you. I'm filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. To see that... Again, that's oh, that's a lot easier to read than believe, right? To see that actually acted out in the church, in our 15 churches, in our Presbyterian denomination, in the country of Ukraine, all of which still exist, almost all of which the pastors are still with their with their churches, all of whom are living without their spouses now. The wives and, and their children are in Europe, uh, have, have evacuated, almost all of whom uh, have evacuated, and they're going on 10 months uh, without seeing their children and their wives, to live that out in that situation, in this situation, I think brings us, number one, challenges us as American uh, believers, uh, I, I hope, and, and I think it does. And number two, reminds us, I think, that in, that in our um, what might happen next in our country moments, and it seems like there's a lot more talk of that recently. In our what might happen in our country next, whatever that worst case scenario is in your head, economically, culturally, politically, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Christ is still on his throne and the church is still, um, the church still exists and, uh, and we still have these promises to, to, to fall back on. The challenge for all of us then is, uh, is not to, and, and I don't mean any of this to say that we should, we should, and, and I don't think this passage says it either, that we should check out of the culture, that we're out, that's theirs, this is ours, I'm going to stop, I don't know, whatever, voting, engaging, volunteering, you know, whatever, whatever. I don't see that at all, and, and that's not true in, in, in Ukraine as well. Half of the young men in our churches are, are, have been called up, and, are, and, 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 are, and a number of our seminarians uh, have been called up and are now serving in the, uh, at, at some level in the, in, in the military. Everybody's playing, their, playing their, their community role that has been given them by the passport that they, that they, that they received, by the, 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 by the citizenship that they received when they were born, as we all do. The, the roles and responsibilities that we have on this earth still exist. I don't mean anything I say here, and I don't think this passage says that that means we, we check out and we don't have any, any relationship with the culture or, or, the, or the roles and responsibilities that we, that we have um, uh, as believers in, in the culture around us. What it does mean, however, that in playing out those roles and responsibilities, we still have a different hope, right? We have a different identity. We have a different cultural, um, uh, rather not cultural, but we have a different citizenship um, that we are. Uh, chapter 6, verse 9. As, uh, rather, 10. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making rich, as, nothing, um, as having no nothing, yet possessing everything. This 
is the challenge for me, I think, uh, personally and for all of us, is how do we um, live as Paul challenges us here to, obviously the answer is in verse 6, by, um, by purity, knowledge, patience, the Holy Spirit and genuine love. How do we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, embrace and remind ourselves of this identity, our identity in Christ, uh, our identity in this covenant, our identity in, um, in the church, um, uh, notwithstanding everything that's going on around us. In our case, you know, whatever's happening in politics, in Ukraine's case, a war, full-scale war, in which it's likely uh, 100,000 on the Russian side and probably 50,000 on the, on the Ukrainian side have died. 150,000 people is a lot of people in, uh, in Venezuela in economic collapse that has happened in there. How do we live with, in and with those promises with what God has given us in the, in, in the community, in the, I mean, uh, moving out from those concentric circles that I just mentioned, in our nuclear family, in our extended family, in our neighborhood, in our uh, state, in our larger communities, whatever they are, clubs that we're a part of, um, and um, all those things that on an earthly level make up our identity. Uh, how do we live out our roles and responsibilities at that level uh, with this truth? Um, and the answer is in hope with our hope in Christ and, uh, and, uh, by the power of the Holy spirit. It's the only way that, uh, that we can do this. And it's the only way to be honest that I've seen it done in the darkest of places and in the darkest physically and figuratively in the darkest of cities, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, to see our, our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, retain their hope, um, in a situation that at least in March and April was hopeless, um, and, uh, retain their hope in Christ. Um, and I think, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here. This gives us, uh, because I'm a missionary, I have to say something about evangelism, right? This gives us the opportunity to share that hope with others, right? When we have a hope that is unexplainable by the context in the situation around us, wait, how are you? How is that? Because of this, you know, when we had, when we were in that situation, Ukraine, Venezuela, or Pennsylvania, um, when we have a hope that defies our surroundings, we have an opportunity to share that. That's true for the church, church in Ukraine, at least. Um, and I see that true for the church in the, U in the United States here as well. When we have a hope that defies the, uh, the expectations that, that we should have, the expectations that everybody else has, when we're able to serve, when other people are being served, when we're able to give, when we should be receiving. Um, that is when people ask questions. How is it that you have that hope? And as Second Peter says, we are we should be able to give a response to that to, to that exact question. Where does our hope come from? With those thoughts and with that challenge from Paul, let's uh, let's cl close in prayer and remind ourselves uh, the power of Christ in us. Lord, I pray for um, hope for all of us. I pray that we would have it, and I pray that we would share it. I pray that we would remind ourselves of these truths that we are um, secure in you and in your kingdom and that we would, um, uh, notwithstanding the events around us, also participating in the events around us, uh, do so in, a, in such a way that, that, um, uh, that shows that we have that hope uh, to others around us. I pray that you would give it to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. In your name, amen.